Welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we bring you Bookshelf, an episode dedicated to the books we're each reading outside of book club, the ones we get to pick and choose. And so, in my stack, we have Born a Crime by US talk show host Trevor Noah and Becoming by Michelle Obama. And in mine, I have Seven Days in the Art World by Sarah Thornton, 84 Charing Cross Road and The Duchess of Bloomsbury, both by Helen Hamp and Help Me by Marianne Power. Keep listening to hear what we thought of them and whether there might be any gems in here for your next book club pick. All that coming up here on the Book Club Review. So Laura, great to have you back in the shed. It's great to be back in the shed. How are the early days of motherhood? The early days of motherhood were tough, but we're four weeks in now, so it doesn't feel so early anymore. And actually, as I'm lounging here on your whatever this is bench, I'm feeling very pleased not to be massively pregnant anymore. The last few episodes we recorded in here, I just felt huge. You had to prop me up with pillows and I was so short of breath. Listen, Laura was never huge. She was a very elegant pregnant lady. <laughs> I should say, I listened to both Michelle Obama's Becoming and Trevor Noah's Born a Crime in the wee hours of the morning, in the early days of my daughter's life when I was breastfeeding. So patches of both books are probably a little bit hazy, but I went back and made some notes to refresh my memory. I realise this is a fiction-free podcast as well, Indeed. What's in your stack? So all mine are non-fiction, although 84 Sharon Crossroad, I wasn't sure when I first started reading it whether it was fiction or non-fiction. Should I start with that one? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. I picked this up in our local Little Free Library. My children's school just around the corner, we had an idea to start a Little Free Library there. I don't know if listeners in the UK are necessarily familiar with the idea. It's more of a US concept, but it's kind of a lovely thing where you make a little sort of cabinet and usually they're very cute and they look like houses and we made ours to sort of echo the architecture of the school a little bit. And it's really flourishing. And you know, ostensibly, this is a kind of a community project where the school, we've been asking for their help fundraising for our library. And this is a way of giving back and, you know, lots of very noble motives. But deep down, secretly, I really kind of wanted to set it up just so that I could have another outlet for my <laughs> to get my rid book of books. habit, <laughs> both to get rid of them and also, you know, my joy in finding them. And it's just so great. You make some very serendipitous discoveries in the Little Free Library. And so 84 Charing Cross Road. This is one of them. Yeah, it's kind of a classic of the book-loving world, I think. I mean, are you not familiar with it at all? No, not at all. Oh, because I knew about it. It's a book about this correspondence between this quite eccentric American, Helen Hanf, and this very British, very reserved secondhand booksellers that she ordered books from that she couldn't get hold of in the States. And so she wrote to them asking them if they could send her whatever. And this correspondence, and it flourished for sort of 20 years between them. And I had never read it. And so I was kind of expecting a treat and I picked it up and I kind of started reading it. And first of all, I was just a bit flummoxed. It's all in letters. And I just couldn't quite make sense of what I was reading. I thought, is this fiction? Is this nonfiction? And the American character, as I thought of her, she sort of seems so kind of over the top. She's just a bit nuts, really. Really? <laughs> and quite brash and almost sometimes quite rude. I found myself just thinking, why do they carry on corresponding with her? Like, she just seems quite <laughs> annoying. <laughs> why did he keep writing back? She's quite demanding. And... I just didn't see the charm of it. And I flipped through it after a while and just thought, no, this is just not for me. What a shame. And then I carried on. And in the second part of my edition is this other book called The Duchess of Bloomsbury. And I idly started reading that. And this turns out to be her account of when she finally did manage to visit England. So the immediate revelation here is, oh, right, this is a real person. At the beginning, actually, I was going to read. She just explains a little bit. It starts... Theoretically, it was one of the happiest days of my life. The date was Thursday, June the 17th, 1971. The BOAC lifted from Kennedy Airport promptly at 10am. The sky was blue and sunny, and after a lifetime of waiting, I was finally on my way to London. But I was also fresh out of the hospital after unexpected surgery. I was terrified of going abroad by myself. I'm terrified of going to Queens or Brooklyn by myself. I get lost. And I had no idea what I would do if something went wrong and nobody met the plane. I especially didn't know how I would manage the mammoth borrowed suitcase I couldn't budge, let alone carry. Year after year, I planned a pilgrimage to London, only to have it cancelled at the last minute by some crisis, usually financial. This time, it was different. From the beginning, heaven seemed to favour the trip. I'd written a book called 84 Charing Cross Road, and a few months after it came out in New York, a London publisher named André Deutsch bought it for publication in England. He wrote me that the London edition would be brought out in June, and he wanted me there to help publicise the book. 
Since he owed me a small advance, I wrote and told him to keep the money in his office for me. I figured it was enough to keep me in London for three weeks if I was frugal. In March, the Reader's Digest bought an article I wrote about my fan mail, and the Digest check bought the BOAC ticket, some expensive clothes, and, as things turned out, an expensive surgeon. With the surgery, contributions came in from all over. The Democratic Club I belonged to didn't send flowers to the hospital. They sent a Harrods gift certificate. A friend, just back from London, stuck a wad of British pounds under my door, labelled for theatre tickets. And one of my brothers stopped by and gave me $100 to go to Paris. I had no intention of going to Paris. I never wanted to see any city but London. But the hundred meant an extra week in London, plus a few frills like cabs and hairdressers. So financially, I was all set. Cabs and hairdressers. You get a little sense of her, I think. Well, perhaps it wasn't quite enough in that reading, but she's so funny and charming (laughs) and, yes, quite eccentric, but just in the most wonderful way. The first few paragraphs I read, I was suddenly really captivated by her. And I suddenly realised, oh, I kind of get it now. I get the tone. I get why she's interesting. And so I read that so happily. It's just such a charming depiction of London at this particular time. Did you say when she wrote this? 1949 is when the letters were written. And then it was published in 1976. No. Charing Cross Road was published in 1971, and The Duchess of Bloomsbury Street was published in 1974, and your edition, which has both, was published in 1976. Yeah, so it's that trip to London at that period of time, and she's just such a charming guide and very knowledgeable about history and literary history. One of the highlights for her is visiting St Paul's Cathedral, and she sort of has this thing about John Donne. One of the things I found quite odd about 84 Charing Cross Road was the books that she was requesting. I just couldn't quite imagine anyone wanting to read these books. I mean, that's very limited, I suppose, of me. She'd just probably throw up her hands and say, oh, God, the generation we have now, you know, they're not interested (laughs) in literature. But, you know, she wants things like John Donne's Complete Sermons, A Greek New Testament, John Henry Newman Discourses on the Scope and Nature of University Education Addressed to the Catholics of Dublin. You know, I was just sort of baffled by this. I thought, who would read these things? But then when you get to the Duchess of Bloomsbury and you start to understand about her and how these just informed her creative life, because she was a screenwriter and a successful one, and a screenwriter and a playwright, and how this interest in old English literature then informed her own work is really interesting. It just kind of brought the sort of literary heritage that we have Mm. to life for me in a really wonderful way. And I just loved her companionship. And it's so funny as well. All these people that she meets, she's obviously very charming. People are drawn to her and then she in turn just describes them really wonderfully. It's such a gem, just a delight. I'd never heard of it. I didn't know anything about it. And then, of course, I went back to 84 Charing Cross Road and was able to almost like decode it a bit better and understand it a bit better and see the charm that's in it, Mm. but that I hadn't connected with on my first cold reading. So it's not so much that I'm recommending 84 Charing Cross Road because I kind of think you could take or leave that. But I did really, really, really love The Duchess of Bloomsbury Street. It was a gem. Would there be anything to talk about for a book club? Probably not. No, it's it's just a it's a lovely read. It's the sort of thing I would now give to anyone I knew who was going to be coming to visit London. I would mm. say, oh, yeah, you have to read this. It's so nice. great. But yeah, no, there's not really much to debate. How about Trevor Noah though? I bet he's a bit more controversial. Well, you say controversial more. I don't know. He's a bit of a marvel. How much do you know about Trevor Noah? I think I've watched a couple of little bits and pieces about him on YouTube. He's supposed to be really amazing and he's very funny and good at what he does. <laughs> yes, to all those things, yes. Yeah. And in 2015, he took over The Daily Show from Jon Stewart, mm. which were big boots to fill. And he was still, I think, relatively unknown at that point. Like It was a big deal for him to get the job. I didn't know that much about him until I watched a Netflix documentary called You Laugh But It's True. This documentary came out in 2011, well before he had The Daily Show. And well before he was known in the US. I mean, in many ways, he was just starting out. And he was followed by a documentary filmmaker who, for whatever reason, decided, hey, this guy's going somewhere. I'm going to follow him around as he prepares for his first one-man show. It was a big deal that he wanted to do this one-man show in a big venue, not just small little gigs. And they interview, you know, long established South African comics, some of whom praise him and some, oof, you know, just the racism bubbling up and what they're saying. You're like, oh. It was utterly charming and hilarious and gave you a sense of his life, this documentary. You can watch it on Netflix now. And so when I was looking for something to kind of keep my brain a little bit occupied in its overwhelmed new mother phase, 
I downloaded Born a Crime, which he narrates. And one of his gifts is that he is incredible at accents and voices. That's why he's so, so funny. Mm. One of the reasons why he's so funny. But it's also why he's a brilliant narrator, because he can do everything in this book in a way, I'll get to it, but in a way that Michelle Obama, bless her, cannot. So Born a Crime is his autobiography about being born in apartheid South Africa to a Swiss father and a native South African mother, Patricia. They're fascinating characters in and of themselves. They weren't actually a couple, or they were maybe a loose couple. Basically, Patricia decided that she wanted to have a child with this Swiss man. They were a part of the underground scene in Johannesburg, where expat white people would often mix with local black South Africans, even though in apartheid they were not meant to intermingle whatsoever. And certainly they weren't meant to have relationships, and it was actually illegal to have a child. And yet Patricia just decided she wanted to have a child of her own. And she propositioned, I don't know even if he was her boyfriend, just her friend and said, I would like to have a child with you particularly, and I'll look after him. You don't need to be involved. And I think this Swiss father said, "Mm, no, I don't think so. But she convinced him. And she had Trevor on her own. So that's the born a crime. He was he was he an was born a thing. crime. He was an illegal child, and he wasn't allowed to walk with his mother on the street. She would always walk behind him. When he was little, they had to keep him apart from his father because he didn't quite realize that he couldn't shout "Daddy, Daddy" on the street. His mother could have been imprisoned for four years, and yet, despite all this, his mother took the risk. She's a fascinating woman, and she's got this incredible son who's just an absolute character now, but was a total terror as a child, would do anything, often quite reckless behavior. In many ways, it's a really light book, despite the tragedy sort of woven through it and the trauma. Yeah. Like Somehow both him and his mother have risen above this background in their experiences. He tells a story about being very young, maybe five, six, with his mother and infant brother who was strapped to her chest, coming back from church because his mother was a very, very devout Christian. And a mini bus stopped and they were the only ones who got on. And his mum being out on the street at this time of hour, she's kind of seen as fair game. And the driver basically starts kidnapping them and verbally abusing them. But he's going to take her and very likely rape her. They get to an intersection and his mum throws open the door. They're still driving quite quickly. Chucks her son out, who's half asleep, this is Trevor, and herself. And they roll onto the pavement, you know, covered in blood and scrapes and just leg it to get away from this man. Oh and I, I know, but none the worse for wear from this experience. You know, they go to the hospital and get patched up and continue on their lives. Later, his mom marries and has an abusive husband. And at this stage, Trevor is, I think, late teens, 20s. So he distances himself from the family. And he gets a call that his stepfather has shot his mother in the head. I know. <laughs> and this actually is in the documentary as well. So I knew it was coming. But he did. His stepfather was an alcoholic and a very angry man. And what's so impressive is that Trevor Noah describes him with such compassion as kind of the inevitable outcome of apartheid almost. You know, all these stunted individuals who were so traumatized by apartheid. When Trevor Noah's mother finally decides that she needs to leave this man, he comes after her when she's with her family and two other children and shoots her twice, once in the head. You wouldn't think you could survive being shot in the head, but it goes past all the things that would kill you or paralyze you. And she lives to survive. So How extraordinary. Just, and then interspersed with all of these moments are some hilarious stories about growing up in South Africa at this time, his experiences in the black township where his grandmother lived. It's a great book. Humbling in that I had no idea really what apartheid was full stop. Yeah. You kind of think it's like segregation. And then he describes it. And I was like, this is like some sort of sci-fi dystopia. It was just so much worse than I had any idea. So a fantastic book. I think it would be a good book club book in the sense that there'd be a lot to discuss. He speaks six languages and he's an incredible mimic. So it's a real pleasure. Hmm. I'd highly recommend it. Yeah. I really want to read that now. It sounds great. Yeah. Really good. I had heard good things. So it's good to have them confirmed. Another one to add to the pile. And do you recommend, the, I wonder if the audio is almost even better than you know, some books, actually. I, I reckon it is actually better because he does mm. all the accents and he does voices when he's telling stories about himself as a child. He does his mum's accent brilliantly. Yeah, it's very good and certainly was gripping enough to help me in my slightly overwhelmed state. <laughs> oh, it sounds great.
Do you want to hear about Seven Days in the Art World then? I do. And you know what? I actually have read this, but have I read you? it a very long time ago. Oh, well, because there's probably quite a buzz about it when it came out. But when I finished reading it, I was looking back to see when it had been published. And it's published in 2008. I think I read it when it was fairly recent. Mm. And it seems like at the time it did really, really well. It was on lots of best of year lists and things like that. So Seven Days in the Art World is a book by Sarah Thornton, who has a degree in art history and a PhD in sociology. And so she brings an ethnographer's approach to studying the art world. If listeners like me, you need to look up what ethnography is, I can help you out. It's the systematic study of people and cultures. It's designed to explore cultural phenomena where the researcher observes society from the point of view of the subject and study. So this idea that she's not on the outside looking in, she's actually within the sort of system that she's examining and talking to people, observing things directly, really embedding herself in it, which of course is all great from the point of view of a reader because you feel like you're right in there with her. Everything just sort of leaps off the page. It's very crisp and clear and full of details and all the details are really fascinating. But at the same time, it whips along very nicely. It's got quite a good structure to it. There are lots of different strands and elements that make up the kind of world of buying and selling art and collecting art and all the other different aspects. <laughs> And so what she does is she divides it up into seven days. Each day is a day in the life of a different kind of institution. So there's the auction, which takes place in New York. There's an art student crit that takes place in Los Angeles, a sort of very famous art school there. There's the art fair, which takes place in Basel. The Turner Prize, which is in London. The magazine, which is Art Forum magazine, which is based in New York. The studio visit is set in the many studios of Takashi Murakami in Japan. And then the last chapter is the Biennale, which is Venice. It's a really nice insider's guide. You feel like you're there on the inside with her and it's very gossipy. It's quite funny, sometimes quite glamorous. You know, it was a really enjoyable read. I can't remember, but how does she get access to these people just by she, being she, persuasive? Yeah, she asks them Great. and she's sort of nice and sharp and, <laughs> and interested. Yeah. And I think people like talking about themselves yeah. and I mean, that's one of the things that's quite pleasing about it is the access that she gets just is incredible. I mean, she sort of knows everybody. She talks to everybody. But also she wears that very lightly. She's never in any way arrogant or annoying about that. Mm. It, she's always very, I don't know, self-effacing, I suppose. Even though, yeah, she's definitely in with the in crowd mm -hmm. in a way that you as the reader kind of are not. <laughs> There's a great Perry quote I quite like. He says, I worry that the book demystifies things so much that the next generation of artists will be over-informed. And I think it's true. It really does demystify it. And I think it would be a really good one for book club if your book club were to do something a bit different, some non-fiction, because it was so neatly packaged up mm. and self-contained and the structure is so good and works so well. And I just think there's probably lots to talk about. And then all these interesting sort of more philosophical ideas about what does it mean to be an artist? What does it mean to collect contemporary art, the buying and selling of art as a commodity? I recall this book making me more cynical about contemporary art than I had been previously. It's true there's not that much of the sort of stirring of the soul at the beauty of the thing that you're looking at and a lot more about which artists are making a name for themselves, whose work is recognisable, how many editions are they going to do of that. It's quite transactional. I recall, I think it was in this book, but maybe you can tell me while it's more fresh in your mind. She talks about how wealthy collectors often build themselves art galleries yeah, because that makes them more eligible to get the art they want from high profile artists. Yeah. And this happened in Vancouver. There's a wealthy property developer in Vancouver who built this beautiful art gallery, but it's only open to the public by appointment or I think for like four hours in the afternoon. And you're like, well, why on earth would you even build this? And having read this, I was like, oh, well, it was just so that he would have more stature and could have access to more art. It's like purely acquisitive. Yeah. Fascinating, though. It is, very. I found all of that really, really interesting. And just the social dynamics of it all. It's a very nice self-contained world. It's a very nice little goldfish bowl to then look in and kind of examine and tease out the different strands. And uh, I thought she did it really, really well. So, yeah, it was a delight. Tell me about Michelle Obama. Well, you know all about Michelle Obama because we do. talked about it on Bookshelf. Well, you talked about it on Bookshelf a few months ago now. Um, I loved it. Did you? I listened to the audio. Did you? Which probably okay. You did too, did you? I did, yes. I yes. found it a bit slow. Yes. <laughs> but cumulatively, it had quite a powerful effect okay. on me. Okay. Towards the second half where the pace picks up a bit and it almost gets more the White House time, where it's almost the bit that you sort of mm. you thought you were interested in. You thought yeah. that's why you were buying the book. In fact, I realised that all of the background, which felt a bit endless to me at the time, 
I really understood why she'd taken so much time and care to paint that detailed portrait of her child and her family and the community that she grew up in. To me, having all that background then really allowed me to make sense of her as a person and the choices that she made and the way she chose to use the opportunity that she had to influence things. That's what worked for me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I remember you saying that you started to listen to it and you're like, oh my God, is this 18 hours? Very 18 slow. hours long, yeah. I had to speed her up. 1.25 or 1.5? Yeah. 1. 1. 1.5. Yeah. So Couldn't it's... go to two. That was too far. <laughs> yeah. But 1.5. I think I, I did 1.25. Yeah. And as I say, I did listen to this kind of at all hours of the day. And I listened to it after Born a Crime, which is super pacey. I didn't love it. I think what I would say is... You get a very strong sense of who she is, mm. but there are almost no other characters. I mean, she talks about other people. I think that's reasonable. But she it's doesn't. Her biography. <laughs> I guess so, but you have no sense of who other people are. When it comes to her children, that's because she's protecting their yeah. identity. When it comes to Brock, uh, I think because he's such a public yeah, and also figure. He's busy writing his own autobiography. He just doesn't want to tread on his toes. In fact, he's written it already, hasn't he? Dreams of My Father yes, by then. Yes, yeah. And, and he wrote two autobiographies mm. beforehand. He can keep churning them out. <laughs> he's, he's, I mean, you did get a sense for how genius that man is. But also, I suppose the revelation for me was what a crappy husband to a certain extent. I mean, he adores his wife. He adores his children. But he's very absent because he's off saving the world, even before he's president. They actually go to a marriage counsellor at one point mm. because she is so fed up with him and his sense of time, which is that he has no sense of time. And so he'll say, oh, I'm coming home from the Senate. This is when he is senator for Illinois. And then we'll show up three hours later when she thought he was half an hour away. So you do get a sense of their differences and her frustration, but how she comes to peace with that because that is just who he is. I was so blown away by her own work ethic. There's a point where her girls are quite small and he is not really around very much. Well, she's getting up at five. Okay, yeah. Her mother, <laughs> I her mother is coming well. over at 4.30 yeah, yeah. <laughs> to watch the girls so that she can go to the gym for an hour. I was going to bring this up. And then go to her day job. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I was just like, just this woman. <laughs> I think I was three days into being a mother, you know, totally overwhelmed. Sure that I was, now, I think I've said overwhelmed three times now. Oh my God, what have I done to my life? You know, I brought this little human being in, but they're going to need me every second of the day because they do when they're brand spanking new. And I was like, oh my God, this is how she did it. But I was like, I can't get up at 4.45 in the morning. <laughs> my mother doesn't live near me and wouldn't get up at four. I mean, neither she or I are morning people. But I'm like, I'm never going to work out again. You know, if this is how Michelle does it, how am I going to do it? Mm. But you know, that's one of the things I found really inspiring about it was her drive. And I think that's one of the things that she offers you is a kind of insight into what it means to live your life in that way. But then the kind of rewards in terms of a sense of achievement and a sense that you're really doing something meaningful mm. with your life. I mean, there's this wonderful moment, isn't there, where she's got it all. She's on the partner track at her law firm. Everything is going really well. And she sort of looks around and thinks, do I really want to be, isn't she on the sort of almost like intellectual property that I can't remember what she ends oh, up focusing on but whatever it is I don't she, she takes a good hard look at it yeah. and yeah, thinks yeah. this is just kind of trivial yeah. and it's not not that it's trivial but it's it's empty yeah. it doesn't really have any meaning at that point she does this wonderful thing of taking stock and reaching out to anyone and everyone that she knows who might be able to help her find a new direction for her career in which she does feel like she's using her skills but to the benefit of the greater good and she ends up working in a hospital helping with the, diversity, I yeah, think. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then at the University of Chicago to, That's as right, well. she's trying to help the hospital's outreach program reaching the poorer black communities who they were struggling to connect with. I think mm -hmm. it's something like that. But anyway, that's just a really good lesson to all of us to consider how we spend our days and what we're doing with our time and whether it's just benefiting us or whether mm -hmm. it's something bigger. I yeah. love the way that she was able to look outside of her own kind of microcosm and reach for more. And I thought that's what mm -hmm. I got from that book. And there's a real challenge to that too, I think. You know, she's not worthy about it. She's not saying, oh, you need to do this as well. It's just more simply by her choices. You feel challenged to yeah. do better. Yes, you do. You really do. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, and one day I will do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure. We're, I do feel the challenge. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what we do with that. But, know. you know, we hear you, Michelle. Yeah. Hey, that's a very good segue then. Oh, Michelle Obama. I can't remember what we said last time when it comes to whether or not Becoming would be a good book club book. I Too think long? It, I think it would be. No, because you know what? I think probably when you read it, it's fine. I don't think okay. it would take you that long if you read it. It's only like 300 pages. It's just when you listen to it on audio. Yeah. And she reads in such a, a measured, measured <laughs> That's way. the word I was going to say. 
<laughs> All right. So, but yes, a good segue then to the book you have in front of you, Help Me yes. by Marianne Power. So this was another little free library pick that came my way. And it's a book that I knew nothing about. It's a hardback, so I guessed it was fairly recent. I think it was published in 2018. And I picked it up and read the blurb on the back and thought, oh, that sounds good. The author is a journalist, Marianne Power, and she had been feeling, as many of us do, that she was sort of really stuck in a rut. And so she decided that she would spend a year following the advice of self-help books and she would do one book a month and she wanted to see what would happen if she followed their advice to the letter. Would she be fixed? Would she become this kind of perfect person. What are we all striving for anyway? Even that is a question that she's sort of trying to attempt to answer. And so over the course of this year, she follows, do you want to hear the list? Because I think it's quite, I do. It's quite I was, nice to I hear was which going ones, to see which, um, which one she I've does. read as well. Yeah. If so any. She does Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Susan Jeffers, which I have read, which is kind of quite an old classic, I think, of the self-help genre. Money, A Love Story by Kate Northrup. The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. This is the one where it's about belief. You have to believe that good things are yours by right. And then, in fact, they will come your way. And if they don't come your way, it's because you didn't believe it enough. <laughs> Rejection Therapy with Jason Comley does what it says on the tin. Can I say this without using our clean iTunes? F it. F it. Okay, good. F it. The Ultimate Spiritual Way by John C. Parkin. Unleash the Power Within by Tony Robbins. Various books on angels by Doreen Virtue. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. I love that she calls this the war and peace of (laughs) (laughs) self-help. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Get the Guy by Matthew Hussey. Daring Greatly by Brené Brown. And You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. I haven't read any of these, actually. Have you not? Because I would say probably most, perhaps, of our listeners might have read one or two of those. I have watched Brene Brown's TED Talk. You and 44 million other people. <laughs> it is not that good, to be honest. I'm not I sure why everyone same. loves it. <laughs> I thought the same. I was watching it earlier. I thought it was great. Okay. No, I mean, like, like I, I love, I was very interested sure. in what she was saying. Yeah. But um, I was like, you know, I really like, <laughs> but perhaps it's to be fair to her. It's like when you come to something, knowing that 44 million people have watched it, you're really expecting something that's just going to blow your mind. And it didn't really do that. And I know The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle because I interned at a dog magazine when I was 21. You mean a magazine about dogs? A magazine about dogs called Modern Dog. (laughs) Did you? Yes, I did. (laughs) Because I thought maybe I wanted to work in magazines and it was one of the bigger commercial magazines in Vancouver. Okay. And it was run by a very cool woman in her 50s and her two daughters who were in their 20s. And they had great offices and it was a lifestyle magazine, really. You know, it wasn't like Crofts. It was all just like cool dog accessories and the like with a fairly big distribution across North America. But the woman who founded it started it after reading The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, which is all like, yeah, I don't know. Is it all about following your dreams? I'm not sure. But that's what inspired her to do it, leave whatever she'd been doing previously. Yeah. She has an interesting moment with the power of now because it's one that she comes back to. So she had read it before and really struggled with it because it's full of sentences like, it is a misperception of your essential reality that is beyond birth and death and is due to the limitations of your mind, which, having lost touch with being, creates the body as evidence of its illusory belief in separation and to justify its state of fear. I have no idea what you're saying. No, neither does she. (laughs) Talk of things called pain bodies, which are semi-autonomous psychic entities. And she's like, what? (laughs) But the point is that she comes back to this book at this moment on this year of self-help. And the thing about this book that I really liked is that, well, first of all, I like the premise a lot. I thought that's going to be interesting. I'm attracted by self-help books because, you know, who doesn't love a bit of self-improvement and the promise of (laughs) everything being better and happier and more wonderful? But at the same time, I'm deeply lazy, so I'm never going to proactively put in. So this for me was perfect. I thought, brilliant. I can (laughs) read about this person who did all these things and I can find out what happens. And what happens is that she actually very much comes unstuck. She really does start to unravel. And it's not surprising, really, when you read her account of how things are going. It's written in quite a kind of frank, direct way, which, again, I liked. It's quite funny, often. I think I thought it was going to be funnier than it was, in a way. Things do get quite serious. And I think, again, if you're anyone who's ever suffered episodes of depression, if you're someone who has had that experience or has a tendency towards that, which again, I certainly do. 
you really recognise what's going on here quite early on and you worry for her and she does unravel in quite a dramatic way and eventually she does go to see a therapist and you're like oh thank goodness because you've been begging her to go and see a therapist <laughs> for like the past three chapters and finally she, you know a friend makes her go and see a therapist who says the problem with self-help books is that you're reading them with the same mind that made you unhappy in the first place and what you need is an outside perspective to mm. challenge you and show you a different view and she's so kind of immersed in this world and she's been prodding away at her unconscious mind and experimenting on herself. And as a result, she gets to a point where she's having nightmares and she can't really function properly. Just, you know, you feel really sorry for her. Actually, in that little bit, I made a note because uh, then Marianne says to the therapist, so do you think I should stop following the books? And the therapist says, do you think you should stop following the books? And that just made me laugh because it was <laughs> such a therapist conversation. <laughs> But, you know, so it's like that. It's it's kind of funny and wry. And yet at the same time, she's grappling with something really interesting, I think, and important, which is what is this kind of life in this culture that we live in that we have everything we could possibly want and yet we're all so unhappy? Something actually that came up, we're going to talk about Fleischman is in Trouble by Taffy Brodessa Agner is our next book. Mm -hmm. And actually that's something that she, I think, is also investigating. And a line from that really struck me, which is like, yes, we're so unhappy in all our happiness. And we are. And I think she's looking at why that might be. And I think, if anything, the problem with it is that it's very much her own personal experience and it continues to be very specific to her. And it's hard to really make bigger generalizations about it. And she doesn't quite go there enough for this book to really reach the potential I thought it had. Mm. But nonetheless, I thought it was really interesting, really thought provoking, really diverting to read because she's funny and sharp. It sounds like it'd be a really good book club book. Yeah, I think it really would be because it's so interesting. And it's one of those books that's it's sort of good but flawed, not necessarily in a sort of terrible way. You know, they're just interesting flaws. Mainly, I loved it. And when I finished it, I kept talking to people about it. It's like, oh, it's so interesting, this book I've just been reading. And this came up and that and, and you know, it provoked lots of conversations. And and then I wanted to find out a little bit more about it. And I looked online and I found a Guardian review that was quite sort of sniffy, I thought. And it turns out she had a blog. I didn't realise she blogged about all yeah, of this. That makes sense. Okay. Before she did the book. And in fact, sort of almost like perhaps the book wasn't the end goal. The initial goal was a blog. I didn't know anything about the blog. And I think it was almost then a suggestion that this book was almost like a kind of cobbled together um, hmm. thing that had evolved out of this blog and almost like maybe I'm reading the worst possible motives into it but you know the sense of making money off the back of this sure. and I didn't see that at all I thought it was a really good book and I can't imagine perhaps the blog would have been as good I think this book is great I'm quite keen to read it I think it seems really interesting an often laugh out loud account of road testing some of the most totemic books in the self-help canon if you've ever worried that self-help might be a euphemism for self-obsession, then this is the book for you. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Whenever I've read any self-help books, unless they're quite practical, I just find they invite navel-gazing and self-criticism and just a bit of self-loathing because suddenly you're just very aware of what you're doing and why are you doing it and why aren't you doing more? And yeah. these people have done more and they've achieved more. So why haven't I done that? Well, and the Brene Brown section of the 44 million views TED Talk on vulnerability is really interesting because what she says is that it shouldn't be self-help. You can't help yourself. It's others that help you. It's the community oh, that helps you. Okay. And it's your connections within that community that help you. Okay. And actually that, you know, you need a little light bulb moments, but that was a bit of a, when I got to that, as Marianne Power did, I think, whoa, yes, you're right. And then what's very nice is that there is a certain resolution to this book that's very pleasing and you're sort of happy for her that she's managed to get there. I mean, I'm curious, you know, it was one where I finished it and I almost immediately wanted to email her to sort of say, well, how are you doing now? And, <laughs> and have you tried this? And I just thought, oh my gosh, she must get like a thousand emails from people saying, have you, did you do that one? Because you oh, know, well, it sounds like it's a very personal account then. You feel like you know her. I did feel incredibly good. Well, this is the thing as well. I mean, I certainly found masses and masses to relate to in there. I thought you could film this. I thought it would make a really interesting film. It has something of the Julie and Julia film book, Yeah, where blog. she cooks her way through Julia yeah, Childs. Yeah, and actually that film I think I've watched it a couple times and I don't really like it except for the fact that Amy Adams manages to make the heroine of that film quite as sort of whiny as she is in the actual book itself. <laughs> I think that's where people get critical of the blog idea because it's like people start a blog with a good hook and there's always an ambition behind it. But if you can deliver on the hook, what's the problem? So where did we land then of these five books, which were winners for book club? Help Me, Seven Days in the Art World. 
and Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. And I think Obama. Yeah. You're looking a little harsh on Obama. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I found it a little bit flat. And because I was listening to it on audio and I wasn't listening in headphones, my husband kept coming in and out of the room being like, she's still talking. <laughs> so you're still, what's happening now? She's still not in the White House? Oh, my God. I was like, can you stop? You're making me enjoy this book less. Maybe he tainted it for me. But didn't you think the ending was so great? It was sad. It was poignant. I was pleased when she talks about Trump's inauguration. Yeah. And she looks around and all the diversity that they brought to the White House has vanished. And she's just surrounded by all the old white men you'd imagine. And she thinks how her advisors would have said, I'm not sure about the optics here. We need to fix the optics. And she's like, I think for this president, those are the optics he wants. And her small act of defiance is to stop smiling. Mm. She just is like, well, that's my optics. Mm. I'm not going to smile through this anymore. Mm. We need to try and read some more fiction for our next... <laughs> we will. We <laughs> definitely picture. will. We definitely will. I have a sleeping happy baby and I look forward to maybe managing at least to read on my Kindle one-handed. And you know what it is as well. I've been reading a lot of fiction, but it's all for book club. Yeah. And so it makes sense that for my non-book club reading, I've been diving into non-fiction. Well, I loved hearing about all these books. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it might take help me off you unless you've promised it to anyone. Oh, I don't know if I'm ready to um, <laughs> let it go. <laughs> I can bring it back. It's not going to go far. <laughs> you can pull it off my shelf and come to visit. Yeah. Hmm. That's all for this episode. On our next book club show, we'll be discussing Fleischman is in Trouble by Taffy Brodesser Ackner. It's a sharply observed satirical story of marriage, divorce and identity set in upscale New York. It made the bestseller lists in the US and the UK and is the latest book read by my book club. But did it make for a good discussion? Listen in to find out. And if you missed it, do check out our latest interview with Bryony Bishop of Bees Bookshare, the book club with a difference. Instead of reading the same book, everyone comes with books they'd like to share and gets to take a new read home at the end. It's the book club for people who don't like book clubs. That episode is available on our podcast feed now. Finally, if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you like what we do, please take a moment to rate, review and subscribe to us on iTunes. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>